I am Dr. Asia Kazmi, and if you haven't been able to tell already, I am a teacher. I am a teacher of mathematics, and my career has been as a teacher, as a teacher coach, but also as a teacher inspector. I'm currently with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as a policy lead and deeply passionate about improving outcomes for children. And part of those outcomes that transform lives for children are the skills that they have, the ability that they have to do many things. But fundamental to those things are foundational skills of improving literacy and numeracy. That's the gateway skill that is the foundation on which other skills are built. And one of the key statistics that drives our focus is if you are born in a high income country, by the age of 10, nine out of 10 children can read. In a low income country, nine out of 10 children cannot. This is a deeply deep issue about equity. And we've heard from colleagues, ministers, respected um, experts in the field about why this is an important agenda. Today, we're going to be diving deeper into how and what needs to be done to really make a difference. So we're not having the same conversation in three years time and five years time. We're actually moving on from this agenda. We have a hybrid event. We are supposed to finish at um, half past two, am I right? And I would love to be able to finish on time. So I am going to have the timer going. Forgive me if that bell goes while you are speaking. Um, right. We're going to start off um, and welcome everybody here. I think other people are going to um, join as well. I'm going to invite Halsey Rogers, who is the lead, economics, um, lead economist in education at the World Bank, for his opening remarks to us a little bit more about the Accelerator program, why, what, and how is it ambitious for our children? Great, thank you very much, Asiya. Thanks for, to all of you for being here. Um, I think for the people in this room, I don't need to belabor the issue of the, the learning crisis, just for a few people, those online who may not be as, as informed, just a statistic to drive it home. Asiya mentioned the learning poverty rate, we now know that the learning poverty rate, the rate at which children could not read a simple text by age 10, was 57% already on the eve of the pandemic. We already had a severe learning crisis. We think that's now gone up to 70% based on, on simulation. So we think eliminating learning poverty is as important as eliminating extreme monetary poverty or stunting or hunger. Question is, how do we do that? As as has said, and that's what this session is about. Um, we really see, and the accelerator program is built around the idea that there are two main dimensions to this. One is technical, the other is political. Uh, technically, um, we, we know how to accelerate learning. We have lots of evidence from the science of teaching and learning. We have evidence from learning at scale from organizations such as RTI um, that, that have built on actual experience. It's not out of reach from a technical or pedagogical perspective. We can get books in the hands of children, we can get teachers motivated, we can get them well prepared with manageable professional development, uh, principals can support them. We've heard already at some of the sessions uh, here about the, the technical kinds of interventions, whether it's through, through structured pedagogy, through better scaffolding, through teacher induction and coaching and support, assessment for learning, there are a whole lot of interventions that we know that will work from a technical perspective. So that's the first, first main thrust in, in the accelerator program is to help countries with those, those interventions, with that, that recipe or menu of, of interventions that have been proven to work to improve learning. The second big element is political. Um, uh, so the question is, if it's technically possible, why isn't it happening in, in countries? Why does it often feel like an insurmountable challenge? Um, it's often because it can be very hard from a political perspective. 
I, I think we think all the actors involved in education do care about children and their learning, but they also care about other things. And often those other interests will sort of dominate when you feel like you're stuck in a status quo, whether it's uh, bureaucrats trying to protect their jobs, uh, trade unions, perhaps trying to protect their position, teachers caring a lot about job security, of course, service providers pushing for profit, like textbook uh, providers, um, uh, even international actors. We may be protecting past positions. Uh, there may be geopolitical interests. There are all kinds of things that can divert attention from the welfare of children. And so the question is, how do we get, I mean, what we know is that to get learning to happen, we really have to all align what we care about, which is getting children happy, uh, educated, learning in the classroom. And the question is exactly um, how to do that. And, and so what we're trying to do through the accelerator program with all these partners is to identify countries that are willing to put those other interests aside, really focus in on, on aligning everything about the system toward the interest of children, um, and, and then using those technically sound interventions that we know work uh, in order to get all children learning. And equity is, is key to this. I mean, the reason to use the learning poverty indicator is that precisely it puts the focus on equity It makes sure that all children have at least the minimum proficiency that they can use to go on to all further learning. And it has to be the foundation for everything else. And so for the accelerator, we, we have governments gathered here today who are showing that commitment and, and moving forward. Um, the accelerator program aims to support government's efforts to, to accelerate learning outcomes at an accelerated speed. It's also to make sure we have better coordination and that's why we're all working together to support those countries. And so we're excited to hear more about that today. Thank you. Thank you very much and very good timing, Hopsi. Um, so as Halsey mentioned, what we're looking at today is the political, why is foundation learning um, um, important, literacy and numeracy important. We're also looking at the technical of how, and then the financial, what we pay, um, how do we pay for that? I'm going, to, um, we have, um, the, Accel um, the acceleration program was launched in 2020 with 10 countries, five of those countries and those country representatives are present here today. We have Kenya, and Nigeria, we have Niger, we have Rwanda, and we have Sierra Leone. And we're going to hear from each of them about what they are doing, and then hopefully we'll have some questions from um, the floor. We're going to begin with our participants in the virtual space and Director General Abdi Ilyas, I would like for you to tell us about why and um, how Kenya approached the issue of generating and securing, securing political commitment? Why did this become a priority? And what are your top three tips for other governments to solidify political commitment for improving literacy and numeracy outcomes for children? Uh, we're just going to wait for Director General to come off mute and share with us. Okay, good Thank afternoon you. from Nairobi. I hope you can hear me now, Madam Moderator. We can hear you. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much. So I'm pleased to share with you the experience from here in Kenya. Uh, in Kenya, we have now been um, emphasizing for a long time uh, the aspect of foundational learning, uh, what we were calling in the past early grade reading, early grade uh, numeracy. And so uh, just like any other, you know, developing country in the past, we are so much obsessed with uh, taking children to school, the quantity aspect. And so, uh, you know, as much as the quantity or the access bit of ensuring that children are in school, Later, you know, our focus not only uh, also shifted from just uh, the quantity, but also quality. In terms of quality, we have been now uh, looking at the aspect of learning has been a major thing with us. And uh, in the past um, few years, we have worked very closely with our development partners, uh, the USAID. You must have heard about the TUSOME uh, program. TUSOME basically is a Kiswahili word, which means let us read. We initially uh, piloted this in very few number of schools, and later we scaled it up to the whole country. 
And I just want to say that the political commitment, especially for the education sector in this country, is, is very much there. We, if you looking at, uh, of course, we started with developing our sector plan, the National Education Sector Strategic Plan, and the goals and the indicators are clearly indicated there, ensuring that at least we're able to inculcate the aspect of early grade numeracy and literacy in, in our you know, foundation level in, in our basic education. So this is a country that spends almost 26% of its annual budget on education. Uh, you are also aware that uh, last year we co-hosted the replenishment for the GPE in London. So generally, the political goodwill is there in this country where uh, education is given, um, you know, the, the place it deserves. So for a, as a country, we, we did, uh, of course, uh, take up this issue of early grade learning and, and numeracy. And of course, as a country, the government provides the number of teachers that are required, the textbooks, the infrastructure, we in service our teachers. And recently, we also uh, embarked on a big campaign on assessment uh, for learning. So uh, we are, when this project ended, as a country, we also tried to sustain the good practices of this project, ensuring that all our children have one-to-one -one textbook ratio for both, re for both reading and numeracy, ensuring that the robust m and &E mechanism that came with the project is also uh, sustained. So I would say that uh, technically and politically, we are committed to ensuring that uh, uh, foundational learning uh, gets the space uh, that it, it requires in, in, in the education sector. Thank you. The logistical things that need to be done, like getting the books to the children, the lesson plans to the teachers, but also the technical pedagogical things like assessment for learning being into, um, um, complementary to the monitoring and evaluation system. I just want to check if Commissioner from Nigeria is online, Dr. Joan Owe, if she isn't, we will move on. I think they might be experiencing some technical difficulties. Okay, so moving on, I would like to turn to um, the Minister for Education from Niger State, Professor Ibrahim Natatu, to talk to us about why um, foundation learning is important and how you are going about it. He will be speaking in French and being a good, good student of literacy, I am going to try and comprehend. Je pense. Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres, Mesdames et Messieurs les responsables des institutions co-organatrices de cette session, chers participants, à vos titres et qualités. Distinguished ministers, ladies and gentlemen, heads of the co-organizing institutions of this session. Permettez-moi à cette importante session d'échange de haut niveau que nous offre le pré sommet de Paris de saluer l'initiative de notre institution commune, l'UNESCO, dont je félicite ici le responsable pour avoir créé un espace de dialogue entre nous sur la problématique de l'apprentissage fondamental et les mesures envisagées dans nos pays respectifs. Allow me, at this important session of high-level exchange offered to us by the Paris uh, Transforming Education Pre-Summit, to salute the initiative of our common institution, UNESCO, um, who I congratulate today for having created a space for dialogue between us on the issue of foundational learning and the message and the measures we um, intake, intend to take in our respective countries. Mesdames et Messieurs, le rapport sur le développement dans le monde 2018 montre que beaucoup d'enfants ne parviennent pas à acquérir les compétences de base en matière de lecture, d'écriture et de calcul. The, la... no. <laughs> the, the World la... Development Report shows that many children are failing to acquire basic literacy and numeracy skills. Seule la moitié environ des enfants en âge de fréquenter l'école primaire dans les pays à revenus faibles et intermédiaires peut lire et comprendre un court passage textuel ou une histoire 
bien sûr, à, à l'âge de 10 ans. Ces enfants connaissent la pauvreté d'apprentissage. Selon le rapport de la Banque mondiale publié en 2019, la crise est encore plus prononcée dans le pays à peuple revenu où 90% des enfants sont en situation de pauvreté d'apprentissage. Only about half of children primary school age in low and middle income countries can read and understand a short text by age 10. These children experience learning poverty, according to the World Bank's 2019 report. The crisis is even more pronounced in low income countries, where 90% of children are in learning poverty. Au Niger, plus de 90% des enfants de 10 ans ne peuvent pas lire et comprendre une histoire courte. Une partie du problème est que trop d'enfants en âge de fréquenter l'école primaire ne sont pas scolarisés. À l'échelle mondiale, ce nombre est estimé à 59 millions. Bien sûr. In Niger, over 90% of 10-year-olds cannot read and understand a short story. Part of the problem is that too many children of primary school age are not in school. Globally, this number is estimated at 59 million. Cependant, même lorsque les enfants sont scolarisés, beaucoup ne parviennent pas à apprendre à, apprendre à lire. However, even when children are in school, many fail to learn to read. De plus, les jeunes et les adultes en âge de travailler en particulier les femmes, n'ont pas de compétences de base en alphabétisation, ce qui limite la productivité et le développement, et le développement face à ce péril grave contre l'éducation. However, even when children are in school, many fail to learn to read. Oh, in addition, young people are work and working age adults, especially women, lack basic literacy skills, which limits productivity and development. Le gouvernement du Niger a déployé un ambitieux programme pour le secteur de l'éducation et de la formation s'articulant autour de quatre axes. In response to this serious threat to education, the government of Niger has deployed an ambitious program for the education and training sector, which is structured around four axes. Le premier est l'accroissement des capacités d'accueil des des établissements scolaires par une politique volontariste de construction d'infrastructures. Le second est la, est la promotion de la scolarité de la jeune fille et son maintien à l'école. L'axe 3 est celui du développement du capital humain, c'est-à-dire la formation des enseignants, l'amélioration de leurs conditions de travail, la promotion de leur carrière, le relèvement de leur niveau de qualification et le quatrième axe est relatif à l'amélioration de la gouvernance du système par l'institutionnalisation de la carte scolaire, l'élaboration d'une feuille de route qualité au niveau central et déconcentrée, etc. The first is to increase the capacity of schools through uh, proactively uh, having a proactive policy to build infrastructure. The second is the promotion of the schooling of young girls and their retention in school. The third axis is the development of human capital, i.e., which entails the training of teachers, the improvement of their working conditions, the promotion of their career, and the raising of their level of qualification. And the fourth axis relates to the improvement of the governance of the system, uh, of the in institutionalization of the school map. Um, so developing a quality roadmap at both central and, and decentral levels. Mesdames et Messieurs, au Niger, les défis restent néanmoins énormes pour les enfants inscrits dans le système éducatif en raison de faibles résultats scolaires qui se traduisent par une grave crise de l'apprentissage. In Niger, the challenges remain enormous for children enrolled in the education systems because of the poor results um, and uh, they're really constituting a serious learning crisis. Les grands facteurs qui contribuent à la faiblesse des résultats d'apprentissage sont entre autres la mauvaise qualité de l'enseignement, une très faible disponibilité du support d'enseignement et d'apprentissage, une mauvaise gestion du déploiement du programme d'enseignement et de l'instruction et une faible préparation à la scolarité. 
The major factors contributing to low learning outcomes include poor quality of teaching, very low availability of teaching and learning materials, poor management of curriculum delivery and instruction, and poor school readiness. Par ailleurs, le manque d'intrants de l'éducation dans les classes et la mauvaise gestion de ressources entrave également le processus d'apprentissage. Les jeunes Nigériens entrant à l'école primaire ne sont pas prêts pour les études. In addition, the lack of educational inputs in classrooms and poor resource management also hinder the learning process. Um, young people from Niger are entering primary school uh, without being ready. Aussi pour élever ces défis, des réformes majeures ont-elles été envisagées par le gouvernement, notamment l'arrêt de la contractualisation de l'enseignement, que ce soit dans l'enseignement général ou de l'enseignement technique et professionnel, le relèvement du niveau d'entrée pour la formation dans les écoles normales d'instituteurs au baccalauréat. Ensuite, la fin de la construction des classes en matériaux précaires à partir euh, des matériaux euh, précaires à partir du niveau de préscolaire et l'élaboration d'un plan de remplacement des classes en période existante. Aussi, la réforme de la politique d'enseignement de manière à faciliter une affectation et une gestion efficace des enseignants, renforçant la formation initiale et continue des enseignants, donnant une plus grande attractivité à la profession enseignante. Aussi, le recrutement direct des enseignants du secondaire à la fonction publique, notamment ceux sortant des filières scientifiques des écoles normales. Ils sont au nombre de 344 et c'est lui des enseignants contractuels jugés performants à l'issue de l'évaluation en situation de classe effectuée en novembre 2020 au nombre de 2150. To meet these challenges, the government has undertaken major reforms, including ending the contractualization in education, raising the entry level for uh, uh, entering into teacher training colleges, and ending the construction of classrooms in precarious materials from the preschool level, and developing a plan to replace the existing straw hut classes or classe en uh, overhauling the teacher policy to facilitate effective um, um, allocation of teachers, uh, strengthening the uh, both pre-service and in-service training, making the pre teaching profession more attractive, and uh, recruiting um, secondary school teachers to the civil service, especially those graduate graduating from scientific streams of the teacher training colleges. Parmi les autres orientations stratégiques figure la poursuite de la réforme curriculaire par l'introduction de langues nationales dans les premières années de l'enseignement primaire le développement d'un enseignement multigrade, la promotion d'un nouveau modèle d'école secondaire du premier cycle en milieu rural ou collège de proximité, l'élaboration de leçons structurées et l'introduction du numérique, notamment pour assurer la continuité pédagogique dans les zones d'insécurité. Other strategic initiatives uh, include the continu continuation of curricular reform, introducing national language in the first years of primary education, developing multi-grade teaching, promoting a new model for lower secondary school in rural areas uh, or community schools, and developing structured lesson plans and introducing digital technology, in particular to ensure pedagogical continuity in areas where the security, station is, uh, the security situation is, is dire. Mesdames et Messieurs, il faut noter cependant que la gestion du secteur est contrariée par un financement insuffisant pour le secteur, malgré la volonté du gouvernement de porter la part de l'éducation à 22% du budget global. La volatilité de l'environnement économique et financier, les difficultés à mobiliser davantage les ressources intérieures et une augmentation des dépenses de sécurité nationale environ 17,5% des dépenses publiques totales en 2018 affecte la capacité de l'État à financer le secteur de l'éducation. Toutes ces contraintes sont exacerbées par la situation sécuritaire qui enregistre à la date du 28 juin 2022, donc à deux jours de cela, 780 écoles fermées affectant 63 939 élèves, 
dont 31 142 filles. Um, it should be noted that the management of the sector is hampered by insufficient funding. The government, despite the government's desire to increase the share of education spending to 22% of the overall budget, the volatility of the economic volatility uh, meant that mobilizing these domestic resources were difficult. Um, but we're currently reached about 17.5% of total public expenditure. Um, and the constraints are exacerbated by the security situation, which as of, of now uh, has resulted in uh, about 800 schools close, affecting more than 60,000 students. Les filles sont du reste particulièrement désavantagées en termes d'accès et de services d'éducation de qualité, en particulier en milieu rural. L'élargissement de l'accès à l'éducation de base s'est accompagné du progrès dans l'indice de parité, mais il reste que l'écart entre les sexes se creuse à mesure que les élèves progressent dans le système éducatif. La parité est établie en milieu urbain, mais l'indice de parité n'est que de 44% en milieu rural. En plus, selon les estimations du Fonds des Nations Unies pour l'enfance, communément appelé l'UNICEF, le Niger a le taux de prévalence de mariage d'enfants le plus élevé au monde. 77% des filles étant mariées avant l'âge de 18 ans, bien sûr, et 28% avant l'âge de 15 ans. Girls are particularly disadvantaged in terms of access to quality education services, especially in rural areas. The expansion of access to basic education has been accompanied by progress in uh, the gender parity index, but the gender gap continues to widen as students progress through the education system. Parity is established in urban areas, but the parity is only 44% in rural areas. Um, in addition, according to UNICEF, Niger has the highest child marriage prevalent rate in the world, with 77% of girls married before the age of 18, and 28% married before the age of 15. So, Minister, uh, merci beaucoup. We heard about the challenges, but we also heard about some of the um, some of the the technical aspects of the work being done. And one of the sentences that struck me was the Naprant Pa Ali, even when they are in school. So when they are in school, they're still not learning to read. So some of the actions that you're taking, and we'll return to the financial aspects a little bit later. I would like to now turn to um, Director of Policy and Planning in Sierra Leone, uh, Madame Adama Wuri, about the actual steps that you're taking to to set the ambition for where you're going to be the target setting process what impact do you think these targets will have and importantly how are you mobilizing support for those at targets to actually achieve them we'd love to hear from you uh thank you very much and uh, good afternoon everyone here uh thank you for extending this um, uh, Privilege to Sierra Leone, taking it as one of the case country I mean, for, for this accelerated program. As you rightly said, as we heard from the uh, director there, uh, Sierra Leone actually launched the, the, the poverty literacy and foundational literacy program uh, together with Bill Gates, UNICEF, USAID in 2020. And this was not a coincidence, it was as a result of evidence based uh, uh, research and revelation. We had uh, uh, the, the, the EF, EFAFTI project, that's the Education Fast Track Edu uh, Initiative then, uh, which focus was only was actually on achieving the Millennium Development Goals uh, 2015, and for which we are just coming out of war, and for which uh, the focus was actually access, increasing access and actually giving remedial uh, 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 education to children that have uh, missed uh, the privilege of uh, primary education. And uh, upon implementation of that uh, project, we also have a, 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 a revitalized education development project in Sierra Leone, the Red Diesel, uh, which also focuses more on, on access, uh, the, I mean, relevance of, and quality of education. But upon the, the, the expiration of that project, um, there we are research that uh, even our children were not learning. You know, they were going to school, yes, we have access, but learning was not actually taking place. So that urged the government to actually get themselves involved in 
having this um, foundational literacy as a as a as a main as a main focus. Now, if you look at the theory of acceleration of uh, the the theory of change of the accelerated program, you have we have the input Syrians, you know, we have the political buy-in. Uh, I'm definitely representing my minister here. He's also engaged in another thing. We have a a strong political commitment from the highest level of uh, His Excellency the President down to the Minister to, to provide quality and free education for all Sierra Leoneans. And uh, also, we have developed a new education sector plan uh, with the main focus, the main overarching goal of actually improving learning outcomes. You know, and uh, we have found out that uh, we have also limitations in terms of actually getting uh, data to monitor our implementation or our activities. We have data gaps in actually reporting on progress. So uh, in as much as we have the input, we have the, the partners also, we have other projects supported by World Bank, actually supporting um, 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 increased uh, learning and accountability at um, um, school level. We also have activities you know, we are inter, in, in, we are doing with our partners. That has to do with data coherencies, data assessments. We have um, um, recently established a, a learning assessment unit, national learning assessment unit, and we are also pleading that uh, this assessment unit will be built. I mean, the capacity of those serving in the assessment unit the Syrian unions will be built so that we don't rely much on technical expertise because uh, it's, it's, it's a bit costly. Uh, other activities also have to do with partners funding. We have partners that are actually trying to do a little bit of uh, engagement in doing assessments in the EGRA, EGMA assessment, in the primary grade learning assessment. That is at the end of primary circle. We have uh, our national examination we call the national primary school examination. We also have at lower and um, upper secondary school, we have the secondary grade learning assessment at the end of this thing. But we cannot wait until they are at the end. So we need to be seeing whether learning is taking place. So that's why uh, those input, those activities will actually be very critical so that we monitor progress as we go in and between the, the education circle. All of this is geared towards actually having a focus on our outcomes, learning outcomes, as we all know. We know that uh, Sierra Leone, Children, just like my colleague, uh, uh, the minister is my, not my colleague, the minister from Niger, <laughs> the minister from Niger was saying, you have over 80% of children at, grade, at the age of 10 that cannot read a common text. It is, it is very appalling. You know, it is very appalling. So how are we going to, to, to improve on that? Now, uh, what we have done as a country, uh, as, 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 as a country is actually, we have agreed to design a program, uh, a project that will include development of the curriculum package, you know, and this do include high quality student books and workbooks, provision of them, uh, uh, expertise and uh, pedagogy for P1 to P3, because that's really our focus. We are also having uh, to develop practical teacher guides, well-structured lesson plans, uh, following an explicit pedagogy approach, which will be also linked to the lessons in the textbooks to improve the instructional practice. And that is why in our sector plan, the first priority objective has to do with strengthening the instructional core. You know, build the, the curriculum. We have revised the basic uh, education curriculum. The senior secondary education curriculum has been revised, but we need to strengthen it. We need to provide more teaching and learning materials, supplementary readers for, for, for children to actually improve their, their early learning. We also have uh, complementary materials for oral English, you know, that God has the official uh, language of instruction. And key among everything is actually how we train our teachers to implement whatever curricula we might be developing. So as it is, uh, the target setting is the first step. Actually, we'll now look at the um, full investment case uh, for zero land poverty as a country. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, the, the phrase that struck me was the coherence of the instructional core, that everything is working to, together to support what's happening in the classroom, the textbooks, the guides, the teacher training, the teacher coaching, and the targets as well. 
Um, I'm going to now turn to Minister of State for Primary and Secondary Education in, Nawa um, in Rwanda, Minister, Honourable Minister Gaspar Twagirezu. You, uh, you heard about the targets now. Rwanda has been ambitious in, um, in making the investment case that is technical and financially um, going to look at how you address your goals. This exercise has been taken very seriously and with rigor, and you have the national strategy for foundational learning. We would really like to hear more about that and how you went about producing the investment case and its key components. Thank you very much and a good afternoon for, to everyone. Uh, and as you just said, uh, the colleagues who have spoken before me have highlighted the problem that we are facing. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, to repeat what the problem is. We all understand um, all these statistics that have been talked about here. And uh, the other question that was asked before about political commitment, uh, and I don't think that's a question anymore because we know the size of the problem. We know that what's happening should not be happening, uh, but of course we cannot be stuck in a diagnosis loop. So. There is a problem. Now, uh, what we need is to act and make sure that we take steps to ensure that our kids can uh, perform at grade level in foundational skills. So what we have uh, been doing in Rwanda uh, with the support of the Accelerator Project uh, that uh, has been um, supporting as a technical and a strategic advisor on uh, foundational learning. Uh, we also not have, uh, in terms of financing, we also have uh, many projects ongoing uh, with one supported by the World Bank. Uh, this is a project now that's uh, up to uh, $340 million that we have been uh, implementing. And this is a package including infrastructure, teaching and learning materials, training, uh, and uh, other components. So, but on uh, the accelerator, what we have done, we have uh, been working on our nation national strategy for accelerated foundational learning, which is a, a strategy that lays out some of these strategic interventions that you are talking about here. And what you want to do, what you want to do different with, with uh, this strategy is to make sure that we set uh, enabling conditions that are necessary for supporting learning. Uh, and we want to make sure that we get the basics right, uh, but focused on learning outcomes, as our colleague from Sierra Leone just uh, said. Because most of the times, uh, what we would invest in, of course, we need investments in, in infrastructure, we need investments uh, in all these uh, inputs, but we also need to make sure that we are really focused on the outcomes. Uh, kids are going to school, but are they learning? So this is something that we need to always be focusing on. Uh, and as part of the strategy, what we have also been doing is uh, developing clear, realistic, but ambitious targets, learning targets. Uh, and you have uh, developed uh, benchmarks uh, in English and in Rwanda. And you have been also looking at uh, also strengthening our benchmarks in numeracy. And uh, we are doing this uh, because we want to make sure that we have a clear way uh, of measuring our progress. Because again, uh, also one of the components of this exercise is to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable to learning outcomes from uh, the class, from what's happening in the classroom up to the ministry's level. So we may need to make sure that we are all holding ourselves accountable. In Rwanda, we have uh, a system of accountability that we call Imihigo, so which uh, mainly translates to a performance contract. So we want to make sure that all of us, from uh, the Minister of Education to the teacher who is in the classroom to uh, the mayors, everyone in the education system, we need to make sure that we are held accountable to learning outcomes. 
Uh, and uh, to make sure that we keep the conversation going, you have also created what we call Foundational Learning Steering Committee. So this is a committee that's made of uh, uh, the Ministry of Education, or our implementing agencies, uh, and all the partners who contribute to this. Because what we want to do is to make sure that everyone is laser focused on learning outcomes. And um, there is something that should be simple, but unfortunately that's not. And this is getting everyone to contribute to the same thing, right? So we have obviously different, uh, different uh, development partners, uh, many people who are contributing to the foundation learning space, uh, but you need to make sure that uh, their contribution is going towards improving learning outcomes. And we need to make sure that uh, uh, we are measuring, we need to make sure that we are actually holding ourselves accountable to learning outcomes. So once again, coordination is very key. And this is why we put together this uh, steering committee to make sure that these things that we are discussing here are always talked about and to make sure that the conversation is always alive. And in line with the steering committee, we have a, bi a, bi uh, a biannual check-in. Uh, we always, every six months, we, organ we call all people who are uh, investing in foundational learning to come and discuss some of the things that you would want to do. And again, we do this because we want this conversation to always be alive uh, in people's mind, to make sure that this is why we are here. We are here to build foundations for our kids and we need to make sure that this is a message that can never get lost. So we meet uh, every year to step back and reflect uh, on what we are doing, its impact, and how we can we can move forward. So there are some of the steps that we are trying to do that came out of these conversations that we are talking about here. Uh, and one of the things that we are doing is to make sure that we uh, do uh, the reviews uh, of uh, time allocations in uh, lower primary schools in the first years of, uh, of education to make sure that we are focused uh, on um, uh, foundational skills, but also to make sure that uh, the kids who do not get uh, enough time, for instance, the kids who are still in double shift system, to make sure that they have enough time to focus on the basics. Uh, we are also, of course, uh, investing in uh, remedial education uh, and to make sure that uh, the kids who are staying being who are staying behind can get uh, adequate adequate uh, adequate support. Uh, and of course, one of the other priorities uh, that we are building uh, an investment case for is the elimination of a double shifting system which is a system that takes away from the time uh, that kids uh, have to, to learn some of these, uh, these basics. And of course, uh, another thing that I talked about is building an accountability system uh, throughout, this, throughout the education system to make sure that we know what we are looking for, but also to make sure that everyone who takes part uh, in this process uh, is doing what they are supposed to do. Uh, but of course, all these things we are talking about here, even if they are enabled by uh, this accelerator program, but I think uh, we should actually even be discussing how could we make this process better. So what I just described is part of strengthening our system to deliver on these learning outcomes. So in Rwanda, what we have done, we have uh, actually created a new institution uh, that's in charge of assessments uh, and, and school inspections. We did that because we want to make sure that we have uh, somewhat something of an external eye to the system and to make sure that uh, if we have other institutions that are in charge of teaching and learning, how do you make sure that we have someone who can assess and someone who can help us check if what we are doing is really uh, making a difference? So, and what we want to do, what we would want to see uh, coming out of this forum or uh, this uh, accelerator and other projects is to strengthen the ability of the systems of education or these institutions to be able to deliver on their mandate. 
So for instance, this institution that we have created uh, needs to be strengthened to make sure that they can elaborate targets and benchmarks on their own to make sure that they can design assessments to deliver on those targets. And after the assessments were done to make sure that they have that analytical capacity to look at the data, understand what the data is saying, and then be able to take action. So, and we understand this is something that takes time, uh, but we need to make sure that as we get this project going, we need to make sure that we keep that in mind to make sure that what we are here to do is to make sure that now that you know what to do, we need to make sure that we capacitate our institutions, our systems of education to be able to deliver on this on their own. Thank you very much. Minister, thank you very much. Um, what I heard very powerfully come through was your statement that is what we are doing making a difference? And the way I often interpret it is, don't tell me what the adults are doing, tell me what difference it's making to children. And your focus on learning outcomes, um, your focus on being accountable for delivering for children um, is, is inspiring. You heard also some common themes coming through about how we support teachers, how we support those children who are out of school, but importantly, those who are in school are not learning. So how do we make that learning happen? The importance of having a strong assessment system that is formative, that allows course correction and also um, checking and keeping us honest that are we doing the right things for those outcomes. We heard a little bit about the, the financial implications of this program, that um, the targets you've set, the investment case you've made. And I would like to turn back to the, um, the issue of the financial support needed to achieve your goals. Um, and, and, and let's delve a little bit deeper into that in the third aspect. So I would like to return to each one of our um, speakers and to for for you to expand a little bit on the significant fiscal implications of the work that you want to do and without financial commitments, how are they going to be realized? So looking ahead, what are your plans for interventions that will allow you to reach the targets? What financial implications will this have? And how can the government and the broader donor community support your efforts? I'll begin, um, I'd like to return back to Mr. Ilyas in Kenya, you were um, very patiently listening on um, in the online space for um, your reflections on the, on the questions regarding um, paying for the reforms that need to be taking place. Mr. Abdi, you are on the thank mute at the moment. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Madam. And um, when uh, we have, of course, uh, when we started this uh, uh, program of enhan enhancing foundational learning in our institutions, especially the numeracy and literacy programs that we have had, uh, we came up with a number of packages, you know, to support the, the teachers and the, the children in the classroom. One of them, of course, uh, was the one-to-one -one book ratio. We have, of course, uh, come up with uh, support to the teacher even within the classroom, experienced teachers supporting them, the people we call the curriculum support officers. We've been training the teachers. And above all, the, you know, for us to be able to succeed in ensuring that these children you know, acquire the foundational learning that's required, we have looked at uh, our pedagogy you know, approach uh, afresh. And therefore, especially for the reading, we've come up with a model we are calling uh, I do, we do, and you do. So the teacher goes to class. You see, you, the teacher, you know, demonstrates, does first. Then the teacher and the children do it together. And then thereafter, you know, you know the children are able now to do on their own. And um, this is a process, for example, if we are talking about an ideal you know, process of taking children through uh, from the stage of learning the alphabets up to construction of an essay or you know, a passage and so on. You start with the construction of the alphabets, then they form words, thereafter you know, they construct sentences, 
and then after that maybe passages and uh, comprehension and, and that is uh, the process so this uh, in uh, i believe requires a lot of you know financial support uh, to the schools because in kenya we are talking of close to 24000 public primary schools as as a government our mainly primary schools the secondary schools are mainly fee free especially the tuition aspect we uh, you know every child in our primary schools receives capitation from government uh, from the minister of education headquarters from the national treasury we disburse money to every child in this school both the primary and secondary education and uh, what we are trying to do at the moment is to ensure that um, together with our partners and the domestic funding we avoid as much as we can duplication of efforts you know that coordination at the national level is is uh, what we are trying we are trying to pool our resources to ensure that uh, we ha don't have fragmentation in financing of education we don't have duplication of efforts so that we work uh, together uh, very closely so as at now especially the support we are getting under the accelerator uh, program what we are trying to do is to you know sustain the gains that have already been uh, got from the tusome project from the government funding and ensure that we support the teachers at the school level there's a program we've just uh, uh, recently initiated calling school based teacher support uh, program where we are supporting the teachers through you know peer support uh, they have visits from the minister of education officials who are well experienced we're coming up with programs where experienced teachers are, are recording you know lessons and then we share with the schools at, at that level what we are trying to do also is the the assessments that we do the fluency test that we do uh, you know at the schools we are trying to provide feedback to the school and this has elicited a lot of you know debate and reaction in our staff rooms uh, at the school level where teachers engage on how to best improve lessons we recently also came up with the lesson study model where teachers work together very closely to prepare a lesson up to the extent of delivering a lesson in, in class where once the lesson is delivered they remain in class they critique the lesson on how to improve you know the lesson that has just been uh, delivered we have formed a community of practice among neighboring schools what we are calling zones we we usually the lowest level of education unit in our country is called education zone it's made up of around 20 schools and these teachers have been clustered together they have you know community of practice in form of community of practice we have uh, uh, you know whatsapp groups and and all that and therefore the minister of education educators were also finalizing on coming up with an online interactive platform where teachers are able to share you know experiences supported by the minister of education officials uh, you know at the national level at the sub national level and uh, uh, we are in short what we are saying is our focus more than ever before is on learning you know yes the child has gone to school but what takes place in class the aspect of ensuring that you know the, the children are able to you know uh, give out the, the actual competences in terms of reading and numeracy so that they can progress effectively in the education ladder later even in, in tertiary institution and in university education is about the foundation we keep on talking about the foundation just like a house unless the foundation is good you cannot put up you know a complete uh, house unless you you have your foundation right so that's all i just want to say uh, about that madam and the issue of financing that is all i just want to say this commitment at the highest level in government and also the commitments that we get from our donors including the world bank and uh, other you know donors uh, we are trying to uh, make use of it as much as we can. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Elias Abdi, thank you so much. I have a lesson plan here for this session. And if I didn't have, I would go and say, please tell me about more about the lesson study because my heart is in, in how we support teachers to continuously improve um, their instruction. Thank you so much for that. Um, Minister, Natatu, I would like to return to you for your um, your conclusion of what you were saying earlier, and thank you, Lenore, for your translation. Okay. Merci beaucoup.
soucieuse de ce défi commun au pays du Sahel, la Banque mondiale a élaboré en fin 2021 une stratégie pour l'éducation au Sahel dénommée le Livre blanc pour le Sahel. Ce Livre blanc de l'éducation au Sahel dans les cinq pays qui sont le Burkina Faso, le Mali, la Mauritanie, le Niger, le Tchad, est une étude diagnostique concise sur des problèmes d'éducation accompagnée d'une description de stratégie à adapter pour les surmonter et libérer le potentiel de la région. Mindful of the common challenges facing the Sahel countries, the World Bank developed a strategy for education in the Sahel in late 2021 called the Sahel White Paper. And this white paper on education in the Sahel, in the five countries of Burkina Faso, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, and Chad, is a concise diagnostic study of the problems of education and a description of the strategies we can adopt to overcome these challenges and fulfill the uh, people in the region's potential. Le livre blanc est principalement axé sur l'éducation de base du préscolaire au collège étant donné que le progrès dans ce secteur constitue la base nécessaire à la prospérité du système éducatif et de la société. Il documente les problèmes rencontrés au niveau de l'école, du système de la société, bien sûr, qui empêche la scolarisation et l'apprentissage de nombreux enfants. The main focus of the white paper is on basic education, from preschool to college, as progress in this sector is a necessary foundation for a thriving education system and society. It documents the problems at school, system, and society levels that prevent many children from attending school and learning. De plus, il avance que des interventions à court terme et des mesures transformatrices à moyen, à moyen terme existent et pourraient générer des progrès substantiels au cours de trois à cinq prochaines années. Des politiques qui peuvent amorcer la réduction de la pauvreté des apprentissages, élargir l'accès des filles à l'apprentissage secondaire et améliorer l'alphabétisation des adultes. Il présente également, pour le plus long terme, les nombreuses dimensions de renforcement des systèmes qui sont nécessairement pour maintenir ces gains à moyen terme. Si les pays du Sahel arrivent à tirer parti des conséquences de la fermeture des écoles causées par la crise de la COVID-19 pour attirer l'attention sur les principaux besoins en matière d'éducation et ainsi mobiliser la société à apporter des changements, de nouvelles possibilités sociales et économiques s'ouvrent pour la région. Furthermore, it argues that there are short and medium term interventions that exist that could generate substantial progress over the next three to five years. Policies that can begin reduce learning poverty, expand girls' access to secondary education, and improve adult literacy. It also outlines for the longer term the many dimensions of system strengthening that are needed to sustain these gains. If the countries in the Sahel um, can use the, the um, the consequences of the school closures caused by COVID-19 crises to focus attention on the key educational needs of the people and therefore mobilize society to make changes, new social and economic opportunities will open up for the region. Afin d'opérationaliser la déclaration de Nouakchott, il nous faut agir dès aujourd'hui sur l'agenda de l'amélioration de l'état d'apprentissage fondamentaux. Pour rappel, à la suite du forum virtuel d'information sur le programme accélérateur organisé le 17 juin 2021, conjointement avec l'UNICEF et la Banque mondiale, le Niger s'était déjà engagé dans le programme, dans le programme accélérateur dont l'objectif est de renforcer le soutien au gouvernement pour réduire la pauvreté des apprentissages par une action ciblée et fondée sur des preuves sur une période de 3 à 5 ans. In order to operationalize the Nokchat Declaration, we need to act now on the agenda of improving basic uh, foundational learning outcomes. As a reminder, following the virtual information forum on the accelerator program that we organized in June of 2021, together with UNICEF and the World Bank, Niger had already committed itself to the accelerator program, the objective of which is to strengthen support to governments to reduce learning poverty through targeted and evidence-based actions of a period of three to five years. Enfin, dans le cadre de ce programme accélérateur, 
la Banque mondiale et l'UNICEF appuieront le Niger à la mise en place des outils de pilotage avec respectivement le tableau de bord de politique éducative au niveau mondial et l'outil Data Mospic. Ce tableau de bord offre une base solide pour identifier les, les, pro les propriétés d'investissement et les réformes politiques adaptées au contexte de chaque pays. Quand ta Data Mospic, il sera mis à profit pour améliorer la responsabilité sociale du secteur de l'éducation. Finally, within the framework of this accelerator program, the World Bank and UNICEF is supporting Niger in the implementation of the tools, the Global Education Policy Dashboard and the Data Must Speak tool. The dashboard provides a solid basis for identifying investment priorities and policy reforms adapted to the context of each country, while Data Must Speak will be used to improve the social responsibility of the education sector. Mesdames et messieurs, chers participants, voici les voilà les défis qui se posent à mon pays en termes de pauvreté d'apprentissage au niveau de l'enseignement fondamental et les solutions envisagées grâce à l'accompagnement de nos partenaires avec lesquels nous sommes engagés dans une co-construction de stratégies de réponse aux différentes crises d'apprentissage. Pour ce faire, le Niger s'est doté d'un plan d'investissement qui décline des actions concrètes à résultats rapides avec un rapport coût-efficacité avantageux. Je profite de cette tribune pour lancer un appel à tous les partenaires techniques et financiers en vue d'accompagner les efforts du Niger dans l'opérationnalisation de ce plan d'investissement. Je termine en saluant notamment la Banque mondiale et l'UNICEF pour leur appui au programme accélérateur mis en œuvre, bien sûr, par le Niger. Je vous remercie de votre attention. These, uh, these are the challenges faced by my country in terms of learning poverty at the level of basic education and the solutions envisaged to get thanks to the support of our partners with whom we are engaged in co-constructing these strategies to respond to the learning crises. And to do this, Niger has adopted an investment plan that sets out concrete actions with rapid results and an advantageous cost efficiency ratio. I would like to take this opportunity to appeal to all technical and financial partners to support Niger's efforts to make an invest this investment plan operational. And I would like to conclude by saluting the World Bank and UNICEF in particular for their support for the accelerator program implemented by Niger. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Okay. Merci beaucoup. On a un rendez-vous à 14 heures. Oh, D'accord. Okay. Uh, J'ai compris. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup pour votre participation. Merci. Um, what I heard before you go, uh, Minister, was the substantial impact in three to five years' time, the ambition for us, for, for you, for your children to achieve um, literacy and numeracy in three to five years' time. I think it's an important um, target, but thank you for um, your participation. And I understand that you, you need to go for another meeting. I'm going to um, turn to Adama Wuri, Director of Policy and Planning, to also reflect a little bit more on, your, um, on the financial implications and the support required. Uh, thank you very much. As you all know, in each country, uh, for you to effectively carry out your education programs, it has to be part of your strategy. And uh, the newly developed education sector plan, uh, we have uh, taken into consideration what governments can contribute, uh, what our partners can contribute. We still have huge financing gap. Uh, but that notwithstanding, that will not debar us from undertaking key critical activities. So the first thing uh, we have to, I have to look at this question is actually coming up with an investment plan. You know, an investment plan. We identify the need to move the, the, the foundational literacy at scale. You know, we need to cost it. We need to align actors who and who we participate in what. Uh, we need to have a plan that includes the package that I have earlier, earlier on uh, talked about, uh, the package of actually having this um, uh, um, uh, supplementary supplementary reading for, for pupils, the teacher guides, the curriculum development, and stuff like that. So we need a plan, well-costed, 
to but uh before we we, we go into that we also have some uh, leverage on the the free education project that the world bank actually uh, 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 is uh, gave the country so with that with that project we will start the fundamentals we start the basics you know wise also will be leveraging on the compact uh, uh, funding with gpe you know so uh because we know that uh, for us to undertake assessments at a large scale it's it's really costly even for for instance the edgar and egma assessment we do uh i mean out of 200 i mean out of 12168 schools we only take a sample of 260 so which is really very small. So if we want to scale up that, uh, you need large investments and we need the participation of actors and donors to actually support us in actually uh, realizing our packages. When it comes to teacher training also, it's very huge. But, you know, as I said, we have already factored this in our, um, in our education sector plan. Yes, the funding gap is there, but yes, we can start the implementation of some of these activities while we leverage on other support from, from bilateral or multilateral cooperation. We also need to develop a formative assessment. You know, we need to develop a very formative assessment. That one also includes uh, uh, financial resources, it includes technical resources. You need to build the capacity of the people that we actually um, move on these activities. So. And also, if we are developing a curriculum package, you know, one teacher, per, one, one, one set per teacher, you also, we also need, we are contemplating on, the, on, on, on setting up a national uh, team of experts to actually do this. And that one also involves finance. So we, we leverage on uh, external and uh, partners support to actually coordinate all of these activities so that we get value for money. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, Minister Twagire, um, your reflections, you spoke um, earlier about the fact that everyone needs to come behind that plan and behind those outcomes. What are some of the challenges in making that happen? Um, uh, uh, it'd be great to hear your reflections on that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, in summary, I, I think the challenge is, of course, people coming together, right? So. Uh, coming together and uh, be able to contribute to a common goal. Uh, but of course, there needs to be that goal, right? So that goal needs to be articulated. Uh, it needs to be uh, communicated in a clear and uh, 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 in a clear manner to make sure that we, if you are talking about foundational learning, you are talking about foundational skills, uh, you're talking about the numeracy and literacy. What are we talking about, right? So, do we have a clear metrics uh, that, uh, and we do we have common goals to make sure that everyone who comes, every partner who comes on board, uh, because we want to to avoid a situation where we will have ten partners and everyone, each one of them have their own results metrics right so we want to make sure that we have a common uh, goal and we have a common way of assessing and uh, holding ourselves accountable so uh to me i think uh the system is the our system capacity to be able to deliver on this learning outcome is very key uh, and under the system capacity, we need to make sure that you have the right policies, you have the right strategies, you have the right accountability or the feedback mechanisms in place. But uh, of course, ultimately, um, once we know what to do, once we have all these policies in place, what we have, once we have all these mechanisms in place, we have all the metrics, we have all the targets. Of course, now the implementation takes resources, right? So. How do we make sure that all we are talking about here is not just gathering good ideas? Because I'm not sure if we are going to ever be short of good ideas. <laughs> so, but we need to also make sure that uh, the good ideas that we have are implemented and to make sure that once they are implemented, we look at what's happening on the ground and be able to build that feedback loop within our systems to make sure that we are always constantly improving what you are doing. So, but I think uh, if we, every time that we gather here, we talk about all these good ideas, we meet all these partners, uh, but I think what we also need to do is to uh, make sure that we increase our speed for implementation. We need to make sure that 
uh, the people who have resources come together and uh, uh, implement this. But again, I cannot uh, emphasize it enough. We need to make sure that we have a common goal. We need to make sure that we do not have 10 result metrics in one system measuring the same thing. Thank you. I, I will reiterate your point about having a common goal and a common way of reporting on that goal and not having multiple ways distracting attention from progress against that goal. And I particularly appreciated the need for speed um, in terms of implementation. Um, we've been a little bit flexible with the lesson plan I've had. I, I understand um, Edo State is still struggling to, um, the commissioner from Edo State is still struggling to join. Um, I would like to have a little bit of an opportunity from some questions from the floor, and then I would turn to Kenneth Russell from UNICEF, as well as Al Albert Nisengemua from ADEA, um, um, but give us about 10 minutes for some questions. So I'm going to turn to the room and I look around and I'm not seeing any questions. So I'm going to give you just a few seconds to think about this. People who are working on this agenda, if you have any questions from them. Halsey, thank you. No, oh, thank you. I'm sure there will be others, but uh, I wanted to ask uh, for Sierra Leone, you talked, thank you, um, about political buy-in from the highest level down through the minister. Very important to get the senior political leadership on board. What are the signs that you see that that kind of commitment is, is also felt further down sort of in the bureaucracy? To what extent are the goals understood by the broader public and, and um, whether the business community, parents, anybody else. So how and how are you reaching out to those others to get them on board? Because you can't do it by yourselves as a ministry. Thank you. And I know it's a hard question. <laughs> okay, thank you. What I mean by the buying political uh, from the highest level, you know, our president was here yesterday is co-chair of SDG4 indicators. So, and uh, the, the flagship program of the government is actually free quality education. And for which uh, with that government has really committed like 21% uh, of uh, public expenditure on education, which is very good, uh, you know, uh, it's one of Tyrone is one of the first countries that uh, I, in the Sub-Saharan African country that's actually uh, spending 21% of its uh, uh, expenditure on education, essential expenditure on education. So that one is a commitment also. But uh, looking at the challenges, everybody is aware because even at tertiary level, you have people that can, cannot even write a very good comprehension and a composition for you. So that's the challenge. Everybody knows about that. We've, we will find out that uh, when we are having examination, we are also battling with huge examination malpractice, all because learning is not taking place. Because if children are learning, there will be no need for them to cheat. So that's why even government has signed a memorandum of association with the Anti-Corruption Commission, the Sierra Leone Police, all law enforcement agencies, you know, to curb malpractice. And it is at the highest level. Even at university, you see people using other people's um, credentials to, to, access, to access university. So this is a call that everybody in the country knows. And it's a call that... Uh, uh, all stakeholders are involved in and trying to see how they can address this. We are also having commitment from even private sectors, you know, trying to give us uh, funding to establish preschool, a, a, a preschool education, because that one also has been a challenge for long. Up to now, we are, our, our gross enrollment rate at preschool level is, is below 22%. Well, below even the sub-Saharan African country, which is also a challenge because with improved preschool early learning, you find out that at primary level, they will be able to re at least identify a word or a text. So government is partnering with a uh, private sector to also, to also invest in, 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 in pre, pre, preschool education. So these are some of the commitments uh, that uh, I, I, I see 
government is trying to address some of these issues. Thank you very much. Kenneth Russell, education specialist and a lead of um, primary education in UNICEF. UNICEF is the other implementing um, agency in the Accelerator Programme, and your efforts focus strongly on supporting governments with advocacy and communication efforts um, to involve everyone, analytical and advisory services, and partner alignment and commitment. What are your key takeaways from this discussion, and what will be your key priorities in the supporting government as we go forward? Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Asya. I think we, you know, I noticed you were trying to manage the classroom at one point <laughs> when there was chatter around. So I saw uh -huh. the teacher coming out. Mm -hmm. um, Excellences, uh, the minister is gone, Deputy Minister. Um, it's a pleasure to be in this, this conversation and to see how we have moved forward since our previous conversation of this kind in, in 2001. Um, I'm going to start with sort of a couple of the takeaways because and it links as well to priorities going forward. Uh, and I, I'll start by saying the ambition is, is commendable. And I think we're we're hearing the, the right, um, at least in our estimation, the right things in terms of what the systems should be doing. And just to echo a couple of those teachers, both in terms of um, trying to make the profession more attractive as well as how teachers are recruited, how teachers are supported, how teachers actually practice in the classroom. So it's it's interesting and, and I think it's a good thing to see that um, continuum, I guess, being, being spoken about and not just teachers and in the way sometimes we traditionally talk about capacity building as some one-off thing that will magically change uh, teaching practices. So that's commendable and an area of work which the Accelerator Program and, you know, the work of a lot of development agencies have, have tried to support and a shift which I think we need to continue to make and support countries with. I was really happy, and I know at least one other person in this room is really happy, was really happy as well, to hear mention of um, multiple of the countries talking about language of instruction. And we often talk about teaching at the right level or teaching at learning levels. And um, for us, we tend to say, teach at, the right, at their learning levels in languages they use and understand, right? So it's, it's making sure that, that when we have that conversation about the levels of which we're teaching children, we need to make sure uh, closely associated with that is um, the language in which they're being, being taught. And so to hear about the, the new, um, efforts to, to introduce languages earlier um, and so on. I think that's, that's well, not to ensure that uh, local languages are being used in the early grades. I think that's, that's really good. The other one um, around capacity building and also a priority. I, I think one of the challenges with education reform is this, I, I guess, our a weakness, I would argue, in how we coach the systems through those reforms. So we tend to have an amazing um, design, and we sort of think that that's going to happen, that's going to be implemented. But, and I'm not sure where I got coaching the system from, but somebody talks about coaching the system or coaching the reforms through the system. And that is change management, right? That is ensuring that we not only establish new institutions, but we actually help those institutions to build capacity over time to take on that role and to be able to continue to um, function without our, our usually, um, whether it is a, a government initiative or an externally supported initiative, but that institution needs to be able to continue. Whatever the, the um, intervention is, need to be coached in such a way that it continues on its own. So a, a priority for us and um, an area of the, the accelerator program is around capacity building. And I think that's something we can, we can have more conversations around and probably also try to see how we build up if we're not doing um, enough in, in that regard. Um, speaking of priorities, the same goes for um, performative assessment and that has come through multiple times assessment broadly and it's good to hear about multiple new assessment institutions being established. But um, yes, ensuring that we are not treating formative assessment as a project on the side, but integrating that 
through the teacher training um, as well, making that a part of how teachers are prepared and how teachers practice. And I need one minute to wrap up and I see you're about to press the button. So please hold on. Um, Good but, but just to make um, a critical point around um, advocacy. And as you rightly said, this is an area that UNICEF is supporting in this accelerator program. And we heard it from a couple of the, the, the speakers this morning, the importance of having parents on board. So the basic question I think parents need to be able to answer, which is part of Halsey's question, is do they know what their children should be learning at the different stages? You know, it'd be great as well if they know what the national targets are and so forth. But do I know what my child should be learning? And can I help or can I check if my child is actually learning that? And part of the communication work, the advocacy work is around, um, especially in these countries where you have strong political commitment, you know, there could be the tendency to say, well, that's covered. We don't need to advocate anymore. We need to shift the advocacy so that we're bringing others on board and so that we're also holding um, beyond, you know, a, a national a minister, a prime minister or president's commitment, making sure that um, those commitments are kept, not just announced, but kept. Okay. The teacher is looking at me intently. I'll stop there. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Albert, I would have loved to have you in my classroom. He's a very responsive <laughs> student. I'm sorry. Um, um, thank Kelly. you, everybody. Um, Albert, um, coming to you, and remember what I said at the beginning, I'm looking to finish on time, but we might have had um, the Edo State Governor, um, Edo State Commissioner, online. Shall we try one last time to see if we can? Um, Madam Joan Obiwawe, um, are we able to hear you? And thank you so much for persisting through um, your connection issues. Yes, hi. Hello, everyone. My apologies, please. Go ahead, please. Um, I think it'll be really important to hear from um, the efforts that are being made in Edo State, um, and I, I will plead with you to say um, we have just a few minutes left, but would be really delighted to hear about some of the remarkable reforms you've undertaken. Okay, thank you. And um, very quickly, or rather in summary, I think for us in Edo State, uh, what has really helped us in our education reform journey has been the political will and leadership of our governor. So from the very beginning, he had a clear vision that he wanted to invest significantly in basic education because we consider basic education as the foundation. We've seen appreciable um, improvement in learning in literacy gains. And uh, we have now taken the lessons we learned from Edo Best 1.0. And uh, we are applying the same lessons now to Edo Best 2.0, which is now sector wide and cuts across the full spectrum. So for us, the key ingredient was the leadership. No of um, stakeholders. By the time we put all of that together and then also strengthen the accountability of our teachers in the classroom uh, by using a technology, we started seeing uh, results. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I think um, there was a little bit of breaking, but it was very strategic breaking. So we heard about importance of leadership and importance of learning from the first phase to the second phase. Albert Nisengemwe, you are the Executive Secretary of the Association for Development of Education in Africa, ADEA. It's a pan-African civil society organization that informs and facilitates the transformation of education. One of the key components of the Accelerator program is capacity strengthening through knowledge sharing and facilitating knowledge exchange amongst governments. For foundational learning in particular, what are your plans to mobilize knowledge and amplify take-up of evidence-based practices? 
and I'm going to, I'm so sorry, but I'm going to give you very few minutes to answer yeah, that big question. Yeah, unfortunately, it's always like this when you're the land, one among the ones to speak. <laughs> but, you take the last one. Yeah, but it's okay. It's okay. The point I want to make is, of course, ADEA is, a, is a really a promoting a platform for policy dialogue and knowledge exchange. And this is where we see the need so, uh, for uh, promoting best practices and, and making sure that we can replicate some of the good uh, work that is going in different countries. Because when you see the challenges always, when you see the accelerator, it covers only two countries in on the continent. You have the spotlight covering a few countries. Africa is huge. <laughs> So how do we make sure that the lessons and practices that we're getting can actually be emulated and then we can provide the advisory and execution support. So among the initiatives that we're doing, and of course we work through our quality nodes, and here in particular on foundational learning, we're focusing on ECD, uh, quality nodes uh, hosted by the Mauritius. We're looking at math and science education supported by, in, hosted in Kenya. We're looking at teaching and learning. Uh, hosted by Rwanda. So those are the three notes, the three arms that we use to make sure that studies are actually prepared, developed, and then we can use our convenings. And we have three important convenings. The ones that are hosted by our ICCANs workshops. We have high level policy dialogue forums that most of you have attended. We have one on foundational literacy and numeracy. And of course we have the three and all, which is our flagship event. I'd like to invite you the next one is taking place in October in Mauritius. Now, what are those initiatives? And this is where I wanted to conclude, but showing really where we need to put more emphasis. So we have an accelerator on one side. We have the spotlights that we are supporting the under gem. Uh, we have the Global Book Alliance and my colleague here, remember this is a, we have a number of other initiatives. We are running the observatory on kicks. Uh, that support really looking at the impact of COVID-19 in Africa's educational system. And there are three important reports that so far we've developed around foundational literacy and numeracy, learning assessment, teach, teacher training and support, and the learner well-being. Now, the appeal to me that I want to make on this is how can we better coordinate our interventions at the country level? I'm sorry to say this because I remember when Rima was running this uh, learning poverty, we used to have this gathering. We used to have convenings, bringing countries so they can learn from each other. Since the accelerator started, it disappeared. So I'm appearing really, if you can look at, ask Jason to come on board and see how we can coordinate better intervention at the country level. It's so, so important. How better, how best can we really coordinate our intervention? Second is the issue of uh, institutionalizing capacity development. We have been talking about capacity for the last 40 years. Countries are building institutions. How do we localize capacity through institutions so that we can phase out? When are we starting to phase out of this intervention? Honestly, this is where I'm really appealing. Let's make it really happen. So that's really what I wanted to want to share and thank you for giving me this piece. Um, I think those are powerful challenges and they must be responded to. We heard ministers also speaking about the importance of coordination, of learning together, and, and we, we cannot be having the same conversations. Um, so Ben, Dr. Ben Piper, some of you are smiling because you recognize he is my director at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We turn to you for concluding comments. You have been part of the research agenda. You've been part of programs that have made a difference and now in the funding organization. Some of the challenges you heard, what needs to be done to respond to them? Thank you, Asia, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, primarily to uh, uh, Minister of State, uh, Madam Director, the Minister, and then the two on the call are old friends, uh, DG Elias Abdi, good to hear your voice again, sir, and uh, Dr. Joan, it's been a long time, hope you're doing well. Um, the accelerators are already special countries. These 10 countries are ones that are unique in the demand they had to respond to the learning crisis. 
many of you have seen in this summit this week an increasing amount of evidence about the need for responding to the crisis. But think about this. These countries were already moving to try and improve learning outcomes before this most recent report. So this are the elites of the elite on the stuff that matters, which is responding to the challenges. And I, as um, director of Gates Foundation, it's really important, I would say, to um, you know, call out the, the support of the ministers and the representatives of the ministers here, as well as our partners, World Bank and UNICEF, who are providing the, the technical support. For me, this has been kind of the capstone of a very rich week of activities. Uh, there was the learning, uh, learning poverty report that was shared by Jaime and others, uh, including the, the Gates Foundation and several other development partners early on about just how uh, massive the problem is, but critically that there's a call to action in response to that. Um, that there are actually things that we can do at scale that will work. There was the study uh, the other day on learning at scale of highly effective programs. And the highlight for me was a meeting in this, uh, actually in this room on Tuesday, where we had uh, President Banda, as well as Madam uh, Grasha Michelle, talking from their point of view as leaders of Sub-Saharan Africa of their demand for more response for their countries in the broader continent. To echo what Albert has said as well about what this continent needs, not only to respond, to have that response be durable and sustainable. My main point is this. I would really like to emphasize pedagogy, emphasize the teaching aspect of this. The Sierra Leone uh, director talked about how important it is that it's not just the plans, it's not just the target setting, it's not just all the meetings we have, it's how that stuff is trickled down into the daily decisions of typical teachers. The Sierra Leone director also talked about structured pedagogy lessons, the minister of Nigeria about these kind of materials that they've distributed. I saw myself, uh, Director General Abdi in uh, Kenya, the redistribution nationally, every public school in the country, uh, seeing new learning materials in English and Kiswahili delivered. I was there in a school the day after they received them. And just the actual excitement that these books have come on the way. That is a fantastic accomplishment by the Kenyan ministry using their own resources, not donor funding. But the question is not on the day that the books arrive. The question is what happens the day after when the teacher decides whether or not to use them. And I think that to me is the real emphasis. I am worried as a professional in this area that we spend too much time thinking about plans that only affect boardrooms and not actually the support the teachers need to implement these new materials in a better way on a daily basis. Uh, Elias Abdi talked about the I do, we do, you do, the pedagogical methods that will make the difference between mediocre instruction and high quality instruction in every school in these countries. As the Gates Foundation, we're very happy to help where there's demand, not just on the issue, big picture issue, but the real process of how to help teachers do this complex task of significantly better teaching. Um, last call, last point to make is just, I'm excited about the call to action on learning that has been circulating. If you haven't heard about this, if you're connected to a ministry, there's actually some, some documentation of what actually ministries, countries can do to respond. And excited to hear that, again, I'm pointing to this spot because this is where Madam Grasha Michelle was talking about her interest for the countries she supports as well as the broader continent on actually making movement on that. So thank you so much. As the foundation, we're excited and honored to be part of this and uh, thrilled to discuss these issues with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Piper. Um, final um, five points for me. What we heard about was aligning vertically all the way down to the classroom. If it is not shifting practice in the classroom, we are not doing well. And it's linked to that coordinate horizontally, make it easier for ministers and policy makers to act. Second point about leave something behind and not just something, leave capacity behind in country. Do not just walk away when the program ends with nothing left there, but develop that capacity. Thirdly, is the coherence of the instructional core. They're talking about pedagogy of improving teaching and learning practice. Fourthly, and really importantly, focusing on outcomes for children. 
And finally, the ambition for foundational literacy and numeracy is substantial only because learning outcomes are really low. Those ambitions, once they are realized, are going to allow ambitions for much wider and much improved outcomes for our children. My thanks, my sincere thanks to Honorable Minister of State in Rwanda, um, Minister Tuageri Uzu, um, Minister from Nigeria, Professor um, from Nigeria from Professor Ibrahim Natuhu, um, Director General Elias Abdi in Kenya, and um, Director of Policy and um, Planning, and, uh, Madam Adama Wuri here, and also for persevering from Nigeria, Commissioner Joan Owawe. Thank you very much, and we didn't do too badly on time. <laughs>